Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, really wonderful to see so many caring people uh, come down for an event that uh, is educating uh, the country whose problem it ostensibly isn't, but it's wonderful to see people disregard borders and understand that we share the same water, the same climate, the same air, the same land. Uh, so thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Uh, we have an incredible uh, list of guests uh, who have come from far and near to be with us tonight. Um, and first, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, a couple folks that have made this night possible. Um, my wonderful co-organizers, uh, my name's JP, uh, by the way. I'm a, a volunteer organizer with uh, 350 Seattle. Um, Erica, <laughs> Erica Gunner, uh, another organizer of tonight's event, and Ruchi as well. Thank you guys so much for making tonight happen. Um, also wanted to thank all of our wonderful co-sponsors tonight, um, Mosquito Fleet, um, the uh, Kai Activist uh, Brigade. Uh, we've got the Sierra Club um, here in Seattle and Washington. Uh, certainly 350 Seattle, who's put a lot of resources and time behind tonight, um, as well as students for the Salish Sea. So thank you all so much for coming together. Sincerely appreciated. Um, also wanted to start tonight by acknowledging that we are on Duwamish land um, that uh, has traditionally um, been Duwamish land and is still Duwamish land. Uh, that was never properly seated. Um, so just want to take a moment uh, to both consider what that means to you tonight um, and also what that might mean in the context um, of our panel tonight, um, which certainly um, has, a, has a large focus on those uh, same issues that are still ongoing. Um, so if we could just take a quick moment, um, that would be great. Okay, without uh, further ado, I want to get to our incredible lineup of panelists. Um, I'm just going to go down the line here and introduce each one of them, uh, and then they'll take their time to speak in turn. Um, so, for starters, uh, we've got Chief Ruben George. Uh, he's come down to us all the way from Canada, um, from British Columbia. Um, he's a Sundance Chief of the Suela Tooth Nation uh, and a manager of Sacred Trust, a Suela Tooth led coalition spearheading current legal opposition to the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Um, he travels regularly across the US and the world to uh, motivate and inspire others. Um, he is certainly going to do that for us tonight. He's been an incredible leader um, of the efforts to stop the Trans Mountain Pipeline up in Canada. Uh, next. Um, going down the line, we've got Dave Anderson. Um, he's the author of Spill. He's got some copies here tonight. Um, it's Spill, the story of oil and orcas in the Salish Sea. Uh, he's a former state legislator, um, and he also served as a governor's appointee to the Oil Sp Spill Prevention Task Force. Uh, he has made oil spills and the devastation they cause um, a huge issue for him and uh, has helped really uh, bring that to the forefront wherever he goes to talk. So thank you, Dave. Uh, we've got Judy Tweet. Uh, she's a Tacoma native who holds a master's degree in atmospheric sciences and is pursuing a doctorate in digital arts and climate communication at UW. She's also a National Science Foundation graduate research fellow and a founding member of the King County Labor Council's Climate Caucus. And last but very far from least, uh, we've got Kiara Rose D'Angelo Patricio, a uh, co-founder of Students for the Salish Sea. Her work centers around how to transform our human lifestyles, transportation systems, food systems, and energy systems to create a society that has a generative impact on ecological systems. She comes down to us from Bellingham. Thanks so much. Just to give you guys a real quick idea of how the night's going to unfold, um, our panelists are each going to speak, uh, and then we'll have a, a time for some Q&A, as well as a quick minute to talk about next steps to make sure that the pipeline never gets built. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.
ACM, HK, CMCI, I had chiefs glued stunts not to slay with it. Chief Yopin on not to slay with Squamish. Um, good evening. How are you guys doing? Good. Right on. So, um, there, I can see you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, Tesleiwiti Nation means people the inlet. And um, the reason why it says that the, the first ancestor of Tesleiwiti was a wolf. He got lonely in the waters right around Vancouver and he really wanted a wife and he wasn't given one so he in a little bit of anger and a fit he swam to the bottom of the inlet and he picked up some sediment he was so angry and he barely made it to shore by the time he got to shore he, he fell asleep with exhaustion and uh, in his sleep he let go of that earth that he's holding from the bottom of the inlet and um, when he woke up as a beautiful woman so that's the waters right around Vancouver so that's the beginning of the foundation of the Tisleiwitu law. Since the beginning of time, um, we, we, th th that story could take hours to explain. But we, we, we actually did that and took hours and hours and a lot of writing to explain our law. For example, if that's our first mother, what does a mother do? A mother feeds you. And. Um, so we broke it down to a science that we've proven working with our own scientists in Tisleiwiti Nation, but we're working with our own agriculturalists, but world-renowned scientists. And we explained that to a fact that 85% of our Tisleiwiti diet came from the waters that we lived around. Just based on those, that law and that legend from the beginning of time created the foundation of, of Tisleiwiti culture, spirituality, and our laws. So we, we started to take apart the whole Kinder Morgan and what they're doing wrong and how they're breaking our laws. So we looked at our legends and our stories and we started measuring the quality of our water 25 years ago. We started doing GIS mapping 25 years ago and that's mapping the traditional territory of, of where, I was, I was a teenager 25 years ago and, and we marked down about 200 places where I swam, ate, fished, harvested food, berries, clams, all this sort of stuff. But I couldn't imagine what they got of the elders that were living there that were maybe 90 years old at the time and, and, and how abundant it was back then and where they hunted and fished. So we mapped all that out. And then we went to Kinder Morgan and we said, this is how you're breaking our law. And this is how it's a fact. Working with world-renowned scientists, what we ended up creating was a 1,200-page document, an assessment of the Kinder Morgan <clears throat> application to expand the pipeline. And essentially, that's how we're winning in court in British Columbia. First Nations have been winning 90% of our court cases against resource extraction. That's over 200 legal victories in the last three years. No pipeline has been built since we started this campaign nine years ago. You know, and, um, but it started before this pipeline, this fight. Like I said, in my short lifetime, 25 years ago, I could go to any creek or any river in North Vancouver and there'd be trout, salmon. I, I used to, we, the tide would go out and we said the table was set. Like there, there's my grandma. Right across from Kinder Morgan, directly across. Mind you, they just put 350 yards of platoon barbed wire that goes over 15 feet high surrounding the Kinder Morgan construction. construction. It goes one third of the distance from the south side of the shore to the north shore. And it's, <laughs> it's ridiculous that we've we gotten this far. But anyway, when the tide went out, the table was set. And um, as stewards of our lands, our, our salmon count for our main river went down to, to um, 6,000 for the whole year. Our main river of salmon. In 10 years, by fixing our spawning beds, fixing the waterfalls, and just being persistent at it, we brought it up to 10 million in 10 years. You, you see a picture here. We reintroduced elk into the traditional territory. We got 37 Roosevelt elk, now there's over 300. First time in 120 years we hunted. Did something traditional and we do one tag a year. But bringing back the elk brought back wolves, grizzly bears, flowers, singing birds. It started completely the ecosystem. 
And the first time in 30 years, you know, in Vancouver, Kinder Morgan's one problem, but we have a couple coal ports. We have um, uranium coming out. We have coal. We have um, the most toxic stuff. If there's an accident, it's chlorine. The most toxic for our atmosphere is, is um, the cement plants. Probably much like uh, Seattle right here. I imagine you have all the same things right here. But one fight at a time. And, um, but the pollution is, is so much that it polluted the water we're having eaten out of there for over 30 years. Well, last year, because we've been cleaning it, mind you, with no resources. Old ancient techniques, we, we, we started to rehabilitate. First time in 30 years, we did a clam harvest two years ago. So we're fixing and re rehabilitating um, what we have. And right there, my son and I, my first trip to the tar sands were, were, um, is back there at Cedar. A lot of you know him already. He's, he's, he's a rock star in the environmental world. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, he just got back from, um, I'm going to brag a little, he just got back from um, United Nations, they offered him a fellowship, they said the presentation that was given bit was better than anything they seen and that was this, that's what he presented on. And, um, <laughs> sit down. <laughs> and and um, by the way, um, we want to share this. Eventually, we want to share this. Um, I guess what I should explain too, because we're having so much success that it's unceded territory in British Columbia and First Nations are winning so much. Vancouver is the most expensive place to live in North America. So at any given moment, there's 50 referrals that we're dealing with where people are asking permission to build in the Vancouver area. We do environmental assessment, which is more strict than any municipal, federal, and provincial government in North America. And then we do an agricultural dig. Then we give them okay or not, whether they can build in their territory or not, or if it's environmentally sound. But we do that. But it's based on, again, this, the data that we've been collecting for a long time. And um, so Cedar presented that. He also went to banks and told them to divest out, and that was a huge success too. But anyway, the Alberta tar sands makes Canada, which population is smaller than, than the population of New York and, and California, it makes Canada the third worst. So that's China, India, Canada. Because of the Alberta Parsons. The size of Earth they want to move is the size of Texas. And I've been there. Like, every, every half a mile they had these army barrack sort of style bunkers where they had police in there and security in there. And, and when we stopped to take a picture, they, they got us out of there. At one moment, there was an open space where nobody was around, nobody's looking. We jumped and we ran and we looked and we took pictures. It was the saddest thing I ever seen. You know, when I talk about Tisleiwutu Nation and why we're doing what we're doing, we could have no negotiated for hundreds of millions of dollars. There's one nation that said no to LNG that was offered 1.3 billion. 1.3 billion. And, and was, what broke my heart about it is their employment rate was 90% for that nation. They, they could have used the money for housing, for clothes, for food, but the same as to slay with your nation. You can't put a price on the sacred. How much I love my son and how much he loves me will do anything to protect each other. We have a spiritual, reciprocal relationship of spirit to the lands and waters. And that's where the same of the people way up north. They had a referendum and they voted a thousand people in that community. 100% consensus, no. They're not going to take 1.3 billion and they're going to use, they're going to fight him instead of, and that's what they did and they won. They won, but the Alberta tar sands, you see that that's a, that's a cancer cyst the size of a, a, a baseball, a, a golf ball. But the people are dying there too. We went there and the lady had blisters from head to toe and said, this is how cancer starts. And it got worse because she started talking about how her five-year-old and her three-year-old were getting chemo. <sighs> getting chemo. And she said, can you help? I said, damn right, we'll stop them. And, um, but the people are dying, the water side, 
The aquifer supplies 20% of, of Canada's drinking water, and they emptied it. And they made the tundra dry. The whole area burnt down. The whole city, 100,000 people, 80% of it burnt down. And, and, and they're just so blind to the destruction that it causes them. But um, they, they want to go from a tanker a week to a tanker a day, and it's the bigger tankers. In our studies in here, it shows not if, but when. It's actually, no, it's an additional study that we did, an 80-page study. This is 1,200. We did an additional 80-page study showing that 87% chance of not but if, but when a spill will happen. Then we did another study showing that you can only clean up 20%. We already knew that. We did another study on the economics of it that it doesn't service Vancouver, British Columbia, and Canada. It serves rich, rich, rich people who are already rich. So you got 13 pipelines already coming out. Eight more proposed. Eight more pipelines proposed. That would generate a quarter trillion dollars annually. Their operation costs are 40%. Their payout is 10%. They're still making billions. They're still making billions. And, and it's, it's, to, it's to service the rich. Trudeau made a political choice to support his rich and wealthy friends. When I met with our government in a room like this, his cabinet, I met with him. And we're supposed to have two more months of talks saying why we don't want the pipeline and how we're going to sue you if you let it happen. Let's avoid spending taxpayers' money and listen to us because we're winning 90%. I, I grabbed Minister Carr, the Minister of Environment's hand, and I said, what are you going to do tomorrow? The worst kept secret in Canada is that you're going to make an announcement and improve this pipeline tomorrow. And he said, all I can see, Ruben, is, is that we're, we're, we're going to make an announcement before we planned. And I said, so you lied. I'm going to walk out those doors and call you a liar. There's a press conference waiting, and I did. I walked right out and said, they're liars. Trudeau lied to you. He, and his campaign promise, and actually how I started, I sat with him and I said, congratulations. I saw all you guys in Paris. I was there, Paris Accord, United Nations meeting. I saw you all there. Signed the Paris Accord, beautiful. Way to go, and they're smiling. And I said, all that means nothing when you approve one pipeline. Their smiles went the opposite way. <laughs> it was true. But I walked out of there and said, we're right into a press conference. I said, you're, 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 you're screwing things up. So the pipelines are big. The, 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 the tankers are huge. That's a shame with all the biggest building in Vancouver. It's dwarfed by these. You know, I, I get calls from everybody. One of the head tugboat operators said they got training down in San Francisco and they said they only had 30 seconds to correct a mistake between two, two straights. 30 seconds. Mm. And that's, that's something that we didn't include because we didn't have that information. And I couldn't use his name because, you know. So, Kinder Morgan, they stole um, um, retirees' money from Enron. They swindled that money out, $11 million, and that's how they started Kinder Morgan. $160 billion company. Oh, they used to be a $160 billion company. I, I'm just going to say this really quick. We went to Wall Street and we talked to the banks and said, you know, this is bad, killing people, we're gonna stop it. And they said, well, why don't you go to Texas and represent us at the Kinder, at the Kinder Morgan AGM? I said, I'll go. And um, I went, I went in their home. I had a good talk with Richard Kinder himself. And, and I talked to their shareholders in a room like this. And I, and I said, you make some choices with your money. You're investors, make smart decisions. I said, this is going down, and then I explained, like everything that I'm talking here, I explained to the shareholders. And, um, and, and Richard, he said, he knew, he knew me, and he goes, Ruben, we, we try to talk to you. I'm just a little nation. We try to go sit down and talk to you, and I said, it's, it's not our duty and responsibility to talk to you, you're only a company. We're a nation, it's nation to nation consultation. Then he lost it, and he goes, go then, leave, get out, go talk to Canada. And I said, see? Is this somebody that you're comfortable investing your money in, your leader? His mad because he knows we're gonna win. And guess what, their stock fell by 60%, their dividends were cut by 75%. I love those moments. I love those moments. <laughs> and, um, 
That's just some ugly facts. You know, here in Canada and also in the U.S., they, they buy the media. They buy the, they buy the politicians. They end up creating policy. Then they break policy, and they're not accountable. Exxon Valdez, 25 years later, still a mess. BP, still a mess. Buried. People still dying, Earth still dying, everything's still dying. They don't care. They're not going to fix it. And that's just some of their track record and double the hull ships. It's funny because uh, one of the guys was doing a presentation, but they left my slides up, and he goes, double hull ships are safe. And I put that picture up behind him. <laughs> <laughs> that's our territory. And the, the purple, I don't know if you can see it, those are nations um, close to the territory that are opposing. Um, just a little quote from our people. Yeah, we're in court. It went really well. So essentially there's, there's 12 cases that came up. Eight First Nations, the city of Vancouver, the city of Burnaby, and two NGOs were suing. Um, we did five presentations to Supreme Court sh showing, you know, our, what our fight is. And every one of those 12 did also five presentations, so that's 60 cases. Here's the good thing about it, that we're hoping, we're really hoping, and um, worse things have happened. But Kinder Morgan, Canada, the National Energy Board, they have to win all of them, all 60. We only have to win one. And we know we won two out of the 60. So I, I'm pretty confident with the Canadian cons Constitution protecting our Indigenous rights. But that picture right there was our presentation to the NAB. I said, this is not consultation. How can we present a 1,200-page document, even you sitting down with your best minds and your best scientists, couldn't go over our documents in a day, let alone 40 minutes? This is not consultation. So what all we did? As we, we explained in depth the, 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 the legend that I shared you, the first man, first woman of Tislewiti. And then they said, now that we shared that song, I mean, that legend, we, we have to sing a song. And one by one, we're all sitting in different areas. We all stood up and we sang that song. And, and uh, that was our presentation. That's all we did. We said, it's, it's this, this, your process is BS. And that's why we're suing them. That's why we're going to win. We've been working with allies all everywhere, everywhere, and I'm really excited about what's going to happen here in Seattle because we need it. I mean, we really need it, but um, we went right across Canada. I have allies in Quebec. The Grand Chief of Mohawk Nation said, "You you mess with this Lewis Nation on the west coast, you mess with our Mohawks on the east coast." That's the achievement. What made national news was really great. Winnipeg said that. Saskatchewan said that. Edmonton said that. We came together, signed a national treaty, saying we all oppose it. So no matter what pipeline it is, we're going to stop them all. And it's funny because Kinder Morgan, they're like, they, they asked me a question on the media and they said, well, Kinder Morgan went through the most stringent application process more than in the history of any pipeline application in Canada. Is that fair? And I said, no. All the rest are going to have to go through the same thing, but worse now. <laughs> it's true, we're going to make them do it, and do it all and stop them all. Um, the BC Summit, all the chiefs of BC, the um, Union of BC Indian Chiefs, all the chiefs of BC, they signed it. Um, so um, I think it was seven years ago when we went down towards Standard Rock. Um, and we sat with the ranchers and the nations there and created the, the first treaty that was reenactment of. In, in modern times, between the Pawnee and the Lakota, and they sat in a meeting, and they called me in, they said, why, why do you want us to be the first? I said, geez, every cowboy movie I've seen, you guys have been internal enemies. It looked pretty neat if you guys signed a treaty and united to fight something else, a common enemy. They said, oh, okay. So they did. And then we got the ranchers involved. And um, we said, hey, you know what, you guys, let's all work together, and they said, okay. So we, we named them the, the cowboys. And Indians, we said, you're the new CIA, the Cowboy and Indian Alliance. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that, that's going across Canada, signing the different treaties that were developed and, um, and uh, in the States as well. 
So we, we, we worked with Standard Rock, and, and not only there too, my son and I, we've been in Australia and New Zealand, has been in Peru, I've been in Panama, Brazil, and Mexico, all throughout North America, and it's the same thing. Same thing, people sacrificing like you to make a difference, and you know what, there is no tomorrow, it sucks. Uh, facts, I know, once I see somebody homeless begging for money, I think, God, in 10, 15 years, you're screwed. 15 years, a million people will exit us out of Africa if we, if we keep going the way we're going now. When we were in Paris, um, went in the back roads, there's half the groceries on the shelves. Germany, Italy, half the groceries on the shelves. We're spoiled here. They don't see it here. There's no urgency here yet. Food's still cheap, but 15 years, I swear they're screwed. See, in less than six years, there's gonna be no edible fish coming to the ocean. That's just crazy, and we have to do something now. With no resources and what Tislewitude Nation did for our land and our water, can you imagine what we all did if we had resources, if we took the five billion, you know what? Americans today gave a trillion dollars in subsidies to, what's your, what's your national debt, 17 trillion? They gave a trillion dollars to fossil fuel companies and cash subsidies. And can you imagine if you put that money towards, there's technology, companies that I consult with, um, Petroset, we, we could take any tailing pond and make it drink 99.9% .9 drinkable water. Anything except nuclear waste. There's technology there. And do you know what the 13 or the 20 companies said the Alberta tar sands? They said, screw you. But now we're going to force them. And then we're going to stop them too. And in the meantime, we'll force them, then we'll stop them. But anyway, I'm kidding. So look. I know the mayor of Vancouver and I know the mayor of um, Burnaby. And uh, actually, every, every municipal, federal, provincial level, there we have allies, and um, we meet with them personally. It's not because they they they, they want to; it, it's because they have to. Because First Nations have the power now, and we're using it the right way to make a difference in, in, for our Earth and for our future generations. But the mayor of Vancouver, his, he, he, to me, he's a good guy. Some people say different, but he's a good guy. And, um, and they're huge allies. They said they'd get arrested. People say, would, would, would it be like Standing Rock? And I said, maybe not, because I don't think they'll bring out water cannons on the mayor of Vancouver, who, who <laughs> said that he'd get arrested. And the mayor of, mayor of uh, Burnaby, the, the MLAs, the MPs, they, they wouldn't, the federal and the provincial leadership, they won't bring out water cannons and shoot them. Right. I said, no. I, I, said, I said, there's too many, too many people that now, by the way, the first town hall that we did in, in Vancouver, in Burnaby, um, right where the uh, Kinder Morgan is, 13 people showed up after we gave out 200 flyers in that town nine years ago. We did a survey recently, 71% of Burnaby residents support to slay with the nation and sue Canada for not consulting us on the pipeline because they don't want it. So if things are changing, people, and this is what I believe in, this is what you have to have faith in. They tell us what to believe in the media. They do. And people get sucked in for it. I think in a little, little bit of a way, Republicans are pretty smart to get the biggest, loudest buffoon to distract everyone from the real troubles that are happening. Yep. And then and it's sort of the opposite for, for Trudeau. Really good looking guy like a smile and say, hey, you know what, I'm telling the truth. And they believe in it, almost. But no, they're not. Trudeau said that, he said, it's gonna be Canada against British Columbia. And I said, damn, I'll take on that fight. I would. We'd have the loudest microphone that we ever had to educate people on the true facts of the destruction of causes and who it truly services. And our study's proven that. And um, to stay with the nation, we had, not long ago, had the second best selling wind turbine company in Canada. We believe in that. We know for a fact that it creates more jobs than fossil fuels. Look like at Elon Musk's company outsold the fossil fuel industry in the first quarter. That's, a, that's, that's, I love Elon Musk, he's my hero. And, um, but, you know, we know for a fact, um, we're, we're changing our community the same way. Our daycare started solar panels, now our whole admin building solar panels, now, now we're gonna start moving to make all the houses solar, solar panels to make sure. And my mom and my daughter do the same thing, they, they have Prius. And me and my son need to get there. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> and and green, green's, it's, it's, 
Again, can you imagine the trillion dollars in subsidies if you took that money and put it towards this and, and, and how different it would be? They're so afraid. And you know, I talked to one, one of them I, I talked to and they're like, why don't you take the money? I said, Ruben, you'd be so wealthy, your, your kids and your, your kids and your grandkids would have nothing to worry about. He said, you'd have nothing to worry about. Just, you know, take the money. But they don't get it. And I said, you know what? If you win, you lose, I lose, your kids lose, your future generation, everyone loses. I said, you know what? If I win, we all win. You win and your future generations will win too. Yeah. And I said, and, and he, but he didn't get it. That's our first solar panel one up. Follows the sun like a flower. And, um, we got some donations for our uh, our, um, our solar panel, and um, there's a couple pr um, protests that we did, and our legal <coughs> principles. So what we're doing down here, we started up in Vancouver and less like we we do all the things, we do concerts, we we do we did a science symposium. We got brought in world-renowned scientists from all over the world and compared notes and and. Um, We've been doing major, major studies and, and, and a lot of experience, experiments and, 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 and a lot of things that we have documented. Nobody has in the world except the one nation up in, in uh, the Inuit. And actually we're going to present it to Lalip at the Affiliate Tribes of the Northwest on December 2nd. And um, we want to share it. We for sure want to share it, but that's just one area we come from. We, we, we have a PR crew that's really good and we push out as much as we can. I think us holding this when we first set it out, Al Jazeera picked us up. We got picked up in Cuba, a <laughs> communist country. South American National News picked us up. I think we got about 50 million views of, of me holding a picture like this, but nothing until recently in North America. NPR Radio, just first time, did an interview with us and they had 30 million listeners. And, and now even the rag mag magazines of Vancouver actually didn't do a good story, but at least picked us up. But things are changing, and we're winning, and we have the momentum. And we, I almost said it again, we have to say, can't take the foot off the gas. Can't take the pedal off the Tesla electrical car. <laughs> we have to keep pushing forward, because we're winning. And, and you know what they do? When we beat a pipeline, Five, ten years later, they come back with a, oh, we got a new idea, because they changed the name, but it's the same application. We have to stay on them and stay diligent and, and make sure that we're going to squash it. We've got to help the green energy to grow. We, we got to we gotta get more people involved. We have to educate, like we did with the Burley Bridge residents, that 13 came out in our first meeting, 71% of residents support us. And I believe it'd be the same thing. We have to tell the American people that they're pulling the wool over their eyes. That if you're not questioning it, you're accepting it, and you've got a gun to your head and you're pulling the trigger, and you're letting it happen, and you're leaving nothing for your future generations. Where do you want to be? And they have to understand that. They, 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 we have to make sure that they know the true facts of the destruction it causes and who it services. It kills people, kills the land, kills the water, kills the animals, kills the people, kills the atmosphere creates fires, creates global warming. Look at Miami, Texas, Puerto Rico, the biggest fires that have happened on Cascadia ever, all the way up to, to Alaska. Thousands and thousands and thousands of miles of fires burnt, burnt everything down, and it's gonna get worse. But we have time, we can still fix it. If, if, with no resources, if we could do what we did with nothing, Let's take those trillion dollars in subsidies and apply it to something to, to create positive change and put pressure on the government and meet with them and talk with them. And don't be afraid. No, I'm not afraid of them. I go in those rooms and think of that lady who is dying and say, it's not going to happen. We're going to do whatever we have to do to stop it. Take the time and spend the resources that we have to, to make it so they can understand. This is Tisleutu law and culture 
an illegal document. We took the time to make sure that we educate people on who we are and what our laws are and how we're going to win in court. Because when we win, everybody wins. But we need you to, too. We have to win the moral fight. We have to win the moral fight, and that's how we squash it. We're going to beat them in court, but we have to squash it with a moral fight. So thank you very much. Really appreciate the time and to speak. So um, I want to watch them speak, so I hope when we do questions, I'm going to come back and sit down, but I want to watch you guys. Okay. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. I have, I'm not the storyteller he is, but I'm, I'm going to tell you a story anyway. A, a true story, a pretty sad story, but uh, it really happened. About 9.48, on March 23rd, 1989, the Exxon Valdez was pulling out of pulling out of um, port with 53 million gallons of crude oil that came down the Alaska pipeline from Prudhoe Bay. About seven miles later, uh, after it pulled out, the the um, the guide that takes him through the narrows there, got off the boat, and he turned it over to the captain, Hazelwood. Hazelwood stayed up on the bridge for a little while. He allegedly had uh, been doing a little imbibing. This is pretty well documented. Uh, he probably had a headache. He said he had paperwork to do. He went down below and he turned it over to the third mate. He told the third mate, when you get to this particular island, uh, first of all, he told them there, there's some, there was a report of some icebergs in the area, small ones, but still icebergs. So why don't you divert to 200 degrees uh, and, until you get to this particular island and then go back into the lane that we're usually in. Well, the, the gentleman he put at the helm was not proficient. He, he was actually warned twice by a lady who was also on the bridge that she thought he should be turning sooner. Well, to make a long story short, you probably know the rest of the story. He didn't turn, and it was too late. He went up on Bly Reef, <coughs> split the bottom open. Immediately, five, uh, 5.3 million gallons of crude oil came out. Over the next two and a half days, another somewhere between 15 and 20 million gallons of, of crude oil, sweet crude, and the reason I say that, I'll explain the difference between that and what comes out of the tar sands in a minute. Why do I tell you that story? Because I'm going to compare that to what it would look like on Puget Sound. Uh, for, for three days, it was dead calm there. They had every opportunity to start trying to pick some of it up, although even if they got all of their equipment out on the water, which they got none out on the water, it was in, in, a, in a storage facility, and there was a bunch of stuff in front of it, and it wasn't ready to go. At the very same time that this was going on, Dr. Ricky Ott, I don't know if you've heard of her, she's the one that documented everything that happened up there environmentally, she was having a meeting in Cordova with local folks who were very concerned about the safety precautions that they didn't think were in place to prevent this very thing from happening, they were having that meeting and the oil representatives were there and say, it could never happen, we've got too many safeguards, and besides if it did, we would just clean it up in no time. Well, we all know that neither one of those was true, <laughs> that somewhere between, the, Exxon claims 10.8 million gallons came out. All the experts say it was somewhere between 20 and 30. It doesn't matter because what happened after that, it, it would have been about the same no matter how much came out. It was dead calm for three days and then it started blowing and nothing had been picked up. And it blew, it blew hard, it was a real storm. Where did it go? It went every place in Prince William Sound. Prince William Sound's a lot like Puget Sound, it's beautiful. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's just, mountains and islands and it's inside waters and it's just wonderful. 
it, it carried that oil as far as Kodiak Island. That's 600 miles away. Now, the reason I tell you that story is because you have to overlay that about, upon what it would look like if that happened in Puget Sound. Crescent City, California is about 600 miles away. We just looked it up this afternoon. It's 502, was it, or something like that. That's 502 on a, on a straight line. Anyway, um, Ketchikan is 600 miles from here. We, the same sorts of things would happen here. What happened there? The A1 transit orcas are going to go extinct. Half of them died right, at, right immediately almost, and the other half haven't had a calf since then. Um, there hasn't been a herring harvest in Prince William Sound. There's been a herring harvest every year, thousands of tons of, of herring. There hasn't been a herring harvested. One part per billion, believe it or not, that's one drop in a swimming pool of, of aromatic hydrocarbons will prevent development of the nervous system in a herring or a salmon. That's, that's no research. So, you know, our orcas are pretty precious to us, but if they had to, they can't see where this oil's coming from, you know? If, if they come up in it with those fumes right on the surface like that, they're gonna, they can only breathe those for a short period of time and, and they're gone. And they, where do they hang out? They hang out in Harrow Straits all summer long. Although not, they didn't, they weren't there much this summer because there weren't many Chinook salmon, but that, that's another whole story. So, you know, the economic and social and environmental consequences in Prince William Sound were just unbelievable. You know, there was, people's lives were absolutely ruined. A lot of fishermen, a lot of the people that had businesses that revolved around the fishing up there. Fishing is the big thing besides the oil. And uh, there were divorces, there were a couple of suicides even, lots of innumerable plans for probably college educations and businesses and this and that went down the drain for a lot of people. The people, you know, Exxon Valdez recruited a bunch of people to go up there and quote, clean up the mess. You saw them on TV with the high pressure hoses and all of that. Well, it turns out they didn't even wear masks to begin with. And they were using these detergents and these solvents to try to kind of make it go away. And, and those people got very sick. A number of them got autoimmune diseases, tumors and so forth. It took like, when, when did they settle it? They settled about 10 years ago. It went, Exxon Valdez, when they first got up there, they said, we're gonna make you folks whole. Don't worry, it'll be okay, we'll make you whole. Well, what did they do? They fought it with hundreds of lawyers for 20, 30, let's see, it was uh, 89, they settled about 10 years. So for 20 years, they fought it, and finally they got the settlement kicked way back down. Well, you know what our Supreme Court looks like nowadays. So it's not really hard, hard to believe that. So let's compare, you know, Puget Sound to Prince William Sound. What are, what are the likelihoods down here compared to up there? Well, let me tell you a few things about up there. Up there, the channel that they were going through was 12 miles wide. It shouldn't have been any problem to go around those icebergs, but I told you the story of how it happened. Uh, there's virtually no curve up there. They're, they're, going, they're just in the middle of the sound up there. Down here, the two places where tankers go are up and down Harrow Straits, the ones coming out of Burnaby that um, the chief told you about. When they're going between Turn Point on Stewart Island and the islands that are just outside of Sydney there, if you've ever been up there, it's only about two miles across there. Same thing in Rosario Straits between Tide Point on Cypress Island and the rocks over by, um, is it Doe Bay on, on Orcas Island? It's only, oh yeah, here we go. I don't know, I don't have a pointer, but. Uh, you can walk over here. Try, to, try to go. This is Tide Point on Stewart Island, and you can see this little, these islands over here. Very narrow across there, lots of tide. Lots of fog in the, in the summertime. Have you been to Roach Harbor lately in August? There's hundreds of pleasure boats in there. They're going back and forth between the Gulf Islands and, and Victoria and Sydney. Sid, uh, Sid, Sydney's about right here, and Victoria's 
right down here. Um, they're, they're going up to Alaska. Anyway, there's lots of them. And there's lots of commercial traffic in there, too, whereas there's almost none. The only commercial traffic is, is the fishing boats. And uh, they're there about uh, one and a half months, the Saners in Prince William Sound. And, and here, there's just all kinds of traffic in my book um, to try to, try to uh, tell a little story about how it could happen. It was a, it was a sailboat. Uh, that uh, was right at turn point, and there was a fog bank. And when the container ship came out of the fog, they, they did this dance because the container ship didn't want to run over the sailboat and ended up going aground on the, on the point at turn point there. So what I'm trying to say is there's a lot more hazards, natural hazards down here than there was up there. Up there, there was really nothing except, you know, the incompetence aboard the ship. Now, to be fair, They've gone to the double hulls. That, that would help, but not every time. If you ground it really hard or if you have a collision, that, that isn't going to help. They've got a speed limit in there. They've got one-way traffic. They've got some redundant systems on those boats that they didn't have before on steering and propulsion. So th they've made some improvements. Their hats off to them. Well, they had to. You know, They weren't going to let them do it if they didn't make some improvements. But in my mind, it's not enough. You know, it's, really, it's really quite dangerous with all that tide and as narrow as it is. Now, part of my bio, he didn't tell you, I've, my avocation, I'm a veterinarian by trade. I, I practiced for 20 some years and uh, on South Whidbey. But my avocation was on my day off, I would go up and commercial fish in, for salmon in, in the San Juan Islands. Actually, I started with my dad when I was nine years old. And we went by Roach Harbor then, before there was any pleasure boats, but uh, coming down Mosquito Pass there. But, I know those waters, I know the tides, I know them intimately. And actually, all of my credentials since then, serving in Olympia and being on the Oil Spill Prevention Task Force and, and, uh, and the Northwest Straits Commission and Orca Network board member for 20 years, actually all of that pales compared to my, my on the water experiences, knowing firsthand what those waters are like. So, uh, tar another big difference between up there and down here is these tar sand oils, they, they have to put a diluent in them to make them flow through the pipelines. It's a dilutant, you know, make them thinner, otherwise they don't even move because they're like glue when they come out of there. And if those came out of the hull of the ship, they float for a little while and then they sink. And when they sink, you know, it's, it's 600 feet deep right off of turn point. You're never going to get it back. But there's a lot of bio, biota up there, down there that is part of the whole system, you know. A lot of it would hit the beach and sink. A lot of it would go into deeper water and sink. But the point is it's pretty, pretty much unretrievable. They had a heck of a time on the Kalamazoo River where they had the same kind of oil go into the river. It took them a long time to get it out of there, and that's what five or ten maybe 15 feet deep, I don't know how deep it is, but the point is it's, it's virtually impossible to clean up. Um, a legislative mate of mine who served on the Ag, Ag and Ecology Committee with me in Olympia, uh, Mike Cooper was commissioned to, to do a, a study on, this was about 12 years ago, on how much of a 200,000 gallon spill, now mind you that's one one hundredth of a 20 million gallon spill, of how much of that would be picked up in 48 hours. The conclusion they came to that under, this is the important part, ideal conditions. You know, how often are you going to see ideal conditions? Under ideal conditions, 40% of it would be cleaned up within 48 hours. Well, where's, where's the other 60%? And obviously they aren't going to be able to pick up uh, the 40%. They probably even though they've got a lot more equipment down here and it's, it's good equipment, you get that oil out in tie grips where there's sticks and popweed and kelp and all kinds of stuff because that's where it's going to go into the tie grips. You, you're going to have a heck of a time with those apparatuses they've got picking that stuff up. And if it's 10 or 20 or 30 million gallons, you're, you're only going to get a fraction of it, no matter how good they are. It, it's a total joke. Cleanup is a total joke. 
You have to prevent the spill from happening in the first place. And the only way you can be absolutely sure of that is don't do it. <laughs> don't go for it. Don't make a five-fold, six-fold, seven-fold increase. It's supposed to go from five tankers a month to about 35 tankers a month if they triple the size of that Trans Mountain pipeline. So just don't do it, you know. I mean, of course, the, the overriding reason not to do it, besides our selfish little thing of not wanting to get our pristine area all messed up and our economy all messed up and our quality of life all messed up, is, as, as uh, the chief said, that, that place up there is huge. If that's fully exploited, that puts, I don't know what the figure, I read it once, billions of tons of CO2 more into the atmosphere. So, you know, we, we all know in this room that we have to move to sustainables, not open up these huge, big resources, especially this one. Uh, he says they're making money. They probably are making money, but it, it's also a fact that this particular brand of of uh, oil in the ground, tar sand, is very marginally economically feasible, you know. It's, the only reason they're, they're doing this is they're sort of betting on the come and, and hoping it goes up in price. If they went at the prices where it was a week or two, or not a week or two, a month or two ago, $45 a barrel, uh, from what I've read, it, it, it doesn't pencil out, you know, it's not, it's not cheap to, to mine that stuff, the big, huge open pit mines, get it through the pipeline to Burnaby, down through the Straits, down, most of it will go to probably LA to be refined. They've got excess refiner capacity down there since they don't have much left in the ground anymore. Um, what else do I have here? I'm not gonna go on forever. Um, I, when, when I heard about this, uh, this pipeline thing, you know, it's about four years ago now. I have coffee every morning at Payless in Freeland with uh, four or five of my buddies who fish, fish commercially in Prince William Sound. I actually took a sabbatical and went up there and fished with one of them one summer and experienced that wonderful place. Anyway, they said, they started telling me about, you know, the Exxon Valdez. I sort of know the story, but, you know, they, they really made it graphic because they were out there doing this pulling these booms around, which was doing absolutely nothing, you know, but Exxon Valdez wanted to put on this big show again. But anyway, one of them, Roger, uh, gave me a couple of books. Dr. Ricky Ott wrote one of them, and there's another one that they're excellent resources. If you wanted to find out what they are, ask me and I'll email you the, the title of those books. But uh, so the more I read, I started thinking, uh, you know, what can I do? to not have this happen, not have, can I do anything to try to slow down the process or stop it, you know? And, you know, I thought of writing a letter to the editor or doing an op-ed or something like that. And then uh, I seized upon this idea of trying to write a novel, which was a long, torturous process since I'm a scientist, not a writer, after a lot of friends telling me, you've got to do better than that, Dave, you know, but anyway, <laughs> by the time I got done, they said, you know, that's not too bad, and uh, so I, I, I fabricate this story of what would happen to have a 200,000 gallon spill and have these, uh, this family that uh, is out here from North Dakota, actually the father was, was in the oil industry, but his daughter wanted to see orcas in their natural setting, so they came out here, and they got real involved in this spill and trying to keep the orcas separated from the oil, trying to get a boom across Mosquito Pass there south of, uh, can we put the other slide up there to show the, the proximity of these tankers going through? That's a tanker right there and that lighthouse right behind it is turn point. I, I just went up there once to kind of, I mean I've been up there many times, commercial fishing and so forth, right on those waters, but I went up there in my pleasure boat in the summertime to see if I could get a shot of of, of a boat going through there for my book or, you know, something. And lo and behold, this huge tanker comes by. He looks like he's going to run into the rock right there. It's not, I didn't Photoshop that, but it's not quite as bad as it looks right there. But you can see that as, as fast as he's going, if he loses steering or propulsion with all the tide that's in that area right there, he could easily end up right there on those rocks. So that's what worries me. So anyway, I wrote, did my little thing and 
and uh, got around and was able to give talks like this a couple times in Bellingham and a couple, three times on the island and went up to Vancouver Island and tried to, um, tried to get the word out. But uh, as far as the book goes, uh, if you publish through Amazon, the bookstores don't really want to touch it. They practically lose money on it. <laughs> That's another whole story. But anyway, I tried to do my part to, uh, to prevent this from happening because this, this is precious area. And like I said, I'm on the Orca Network Board. I don't want to see the orcas go away. If, if this thing happened, they would suffer some of the same kind of fate as they did up in Prince Louis Sound, which is absolutely criminal, devastating, uh, an act against God, do I? This is a church, isn't it? I can say that. Anyway, uh, really that's all I've got to say is uh, let's not let it happen if we can. Pipeline. I also wanted to thank um, Chief Reuben George and the leadership, and the moral courage of his nation in really leading the world in what climate justice looks like. And I started my doctoral work in the University of Washington studying climate change, so I want to put this pipeline project in that kind of perspective, the perspective of climate change. And I want to motivate it by showing you this figure. I know some of you can't see the slides here, so I'll do my best to, to describe what's on them for those of you who can't see it. But this is an action that a group did at the tar sands in Alberta. And they put a large banner on the ground that you can see from the sky that says, tar sands, climate crime. 60 years ago, we wouldn't have known what a climate crime is, that's something. Does that help with the visibility? Right, so, so um, I think in the last 15 years or so, we have this sense that there are crimes against the climate, and the Kinder Morgan pipeline is one of those. What does that actually mean, to have a crime against the climate? Well, our, um, our understanding of the Earth system is advancing to the extent that we can see things like changes in the composition of the gases in the atmosphere. NASA made this figure, I think it's one of the most beautiful ones. It uh, shows the atmospheric CO2 levels over the last 400,000 years. We get this data from ice cores in Antarctica, and the, the way that the ice cores record the history of the atmosphere is they're made by snow that falls winter after winter, actually year-round. It's so cold there that that snow never melts. So it just gets compacted year after year after year, and it gets buried deeper into the ground. And in the snow, each of those snow crystals are tiny little air bubbles that trap uh, little samples of the air in the year in which they fell. So these ice cores tell us how much CO2 has been in the atmosphere over these last 400,000 um, years. There's two things you can see from this. Number one, the level of CO2 in the atmosphere now is higher than it's been over the geologic record. Let that sink in. It has never been this high in the geologic record. The other thing you can see from this is that it's rising faster than it's ever risen over the geologic record. So we are conducting a massively uncontrolled experiment in the climate system. And it's having impacts. It's having impacts on lots of systems of the world. The one I want to focus on is um, the Arctic, which is, I think, on the front lines of climate change. I did some of my master's research looking at sea ice, and this is a figure that shows you a couple things. It shows you um, how much the total area of sea ice in the Arctic every year, uh, month by month. So you can see there's a lot of ice over the Arctic Ocean in the winter, and then it melts back, not completely, but it melts back a bit in the summer when the sun comes and warms the surface of the ocean, and then it grows back again in the winter. And 
year after year, the satellite record has showed us that that sea ice is declining. And this has a positive feedback because sea ice is reflective of the sun. If you melt sea ice and you expose the dark ocean underneath, it absorbs more sunlight. So this is an indication, this reducing sea ice is an indication that we're already seeing the effect of that CO2 in the atmosphere. And if you look just at what this, the, the, the change in sea ice has been over the month of September, that's what you can see here in this figure, um, it's reduced by over 40% um, since we started measuring it with satellites in the late 1970s. And one thing that frustrated me as I um, was doing sci climate science was we make a lot of figures like this. And, you know, they show the information really clearly, but they don't tell the whole story. So um, I started working with um, sound artists to develop new ways of sharing climate data, and I want to share one of those with you now. It's a sound recording, or it's a, sa it's a soundtrack that was made from the satellite uh, Arctic sea ice data. And each note that you'll hear is the, um, represents how much ice was over the Arctic Ocean for a given month. So you're gonna hear if the note is higher, that means there was more ice. If the note is lower, that means there's less ice. You also notice that most of what you hear is just this annual cycle with more ice in the winter, less ice in the summer. So in order to help draw out this signal, I also made it louder when there's more ice and softer when there's less ice, um, particularly in the summer season. So I just wanted to explain, and there's also a layering of natural sound recordings in the sound of a bowhead whale from the Arctic. There are Arctic whales um, of ships and of uh, sea. And it's short, it's just a minute and 20 seconds. So I'll play that for you now. So I want to say a little bit more about what changes in Arctic sea ice mean for human communities that live there. CNN did a really nice interview of this couple from Shishmaref, Alaska, Shelton and Clara Kokio, and they're shown in their living room with a picture of their deceased son, Norman, who died when falling through the ice in 2007. And um, just to jump back here to this figure, 2007 was one of the lowest years of sea ice extent on record. It was a really unusual summer. The town of Shishmaref, where these two live, voted a few years ago to relocate because they're on a small island, coastal island, that's built on permafrost, permanently frozen ground. But that permafrost is thawing. And the combination of permafrost thaw and sea ice retreat means that more waves are reaching the coast because the sea ice isn't there to damp them, so their homes are literally falling into the ocean. So they voted to relocate their community to safer ground, and are figuring out how to do that with very limited resources. So that's sort of the backdrop of this climate crime that we need to keep in mind when we're 
thinking about the effects of the Kinder Morgan pipeline. It's one of many climate crimes. The uh, Congressional Research Services did a, the, this is a nonpartisan government agency in DC that does research uh, for Congress. And they made this report showing that the car, Canada tar sands are the most, um, have the highest emissions intensity of any oil in the oil producing nations. That means that they have more emissions per megajoule of power generated than any other country. So this is really dirty fuel that we're getting out of the tar sands. We need to keep it in the ground. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna also mention that the tar, so why, why does Kinder Morgan want to build the Trans Mountain Pipeline? Well, because Asian markets want to buy the oil. Because a lot of Asian um, countries are seeing more people rise into the middle class, that's a good thing, um, coming out of poverty, but they're um, wanting to buy the cheapest forms of power, and if that's oil, they'll buy it. So the goal for Kinder Morgan is to build this expanded pipeline to Vancouver so that that um, oil can be shipped to Asian markets. The Keystone XL pipeline was also meant to transport tar sands oil to um, the Gulf Coast for transport as well. Uh, a little bit about the company. Its headquarters are in Houston, Texas. This is an American company. It was formed in 1997, as the chief said, when two high-level Enron executives bought pipelines and other assets from Enron. The founder and CEO, Richard Kinder's net worth is $9.4 billion and he is the 137th richest person in the world. Uh, Kinder Morgan has not made friends with a lot of the communities that it's worked in, um, both in the United States and in Canada. So, um, Chief mentioned Barnaby. They had a oil spill in their town a few years ago. Uh, so it was uh, not very difficult, I think, for them to want to oppose the pipeline. and. So there's these big, um, very likely to be successful legal battles in the court systems. There's also challenges to the regulatory system. So uh, the town of Barnaby did not issue the permit that Kinder Morgan needed. Kinder Morgan has uh, appealed that to the Canada's Energy Board, which will probably release a decision by December 4th. Kinder Morgan asked for an expedited review of that appeal. Um, so there's this regulatory battle in addition to the legal battles going on. So I've talked about the Trans Mountain Pipeline in the context of climate change. And one of the challenges I think that comes up for me and probably for many of you too is that it seems like they're so, it's such a big problem, right? And um, even, you know, we're, we're we're going to keep the tar sands oil in the ground, right? But there's a lot more oil that's coming out of the ground. One of the things that we need to develop is this, this sense that climate justice work is a continual process. It's not just one battle. It is an ongoing act of becoming an environmental citizen, of growing a decent and humane society. So we're here tonight focusing on the Kinder Morgan pipeline and, and keeping that um, from, from becoming real. But we also want to um, make this something that we just sort of incorporate into our thinking about being in the world and being as citizens. Uh, because again, sort of these battles are ongoing. So the Keystone XL pipeline has had a tortuous history after being approved last spring and starting construction. It's now seeking more legal, it's, it's facing more legal battles in Nebraska where conservative farmers and ranchers are concerned about eminent domain and losing their um, farm and ranch lands. So the Keystone XL pipeline is um, uh, uh, uncertain, its future is uncertain as well. I'm saying this just to give, um, I think we, we need to be keeping these stories of activism and of community solidarity in our minds as we think about this immense issue. Also, because here in our own backyard, there is um, a lot more oil that's likely to come out of the ground from Texas. So this is an article, as I was doing research for this talk, <laughs> I learned a lot. I learned that due to new technologies in fracking, um, one of the largest oil reserves has been found in the Permian Basin in Texas. And it means that the US is slated to become the largest oil producing nation in the world. Um, ahead of Russia, ahead of uh, Saudi Arabia, and Canada. 
So this is likely to have a big effect on the world oil market. And you can see, um, some of you can see the time series here of oil produced from the Permian Basin in, in, um, in Texas, um, reading a, reaching a peak in the late 70s and then dropping uh, low to about 300 uh, million barrels per year. I wasn't sure if that was million or thousand. And then jumping back up in 2016 to 750 million. So this is a big task, right? We have lots of oil coming out of the ground, driving more and more carbon into the atmosphere, wreaking havoc on the climate system. So again, we need to fight back against these climate crimes. We need to build our stamina. We need to build our ingenuity. We need to build in love and persistence to safeguard our climate. Because again, the US is on track to become a net exporter of oil by 2027 due to the new oil reserves that are, can be accessed in the Permian Basin. So where do we go from here? Well, that's why we're here tonight, and I don't have all the answers to that. But one thing I wanted to offer up is to reflect on where your talents and joys can intersect with this work. Because in order to have that stamina and that persistence, you need to find some joy in it. And so you can ask yourself, do you like talking with people? Do you like developing creative demonstrations? Do you like writing? I know there's some writers in this group. Do you like event planning? Or are you a musician or a scientist or an artist or a teacher? Anything that you're doing, you can connect to the climate justice movement. And you can bring those skills to bear on the work that we need to do, as the organizers here did today to bring us all together and to educate us and to share. So I just want to encourage us all to think about how we can bring our um, skills and talents to the table to move climate justice forward and to prevent climate crimes. Thank you. Chiara Rose D'Angelo Patricio, um, and it means clear rose of the angels of noble birth. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about how to build a cross-border um, movement to stop the Kinder Morgan pipeline. Um, but first I want to tell you a little bit about myself and then a little bit about why I'm passionate about this specific issue. Um, I first want to raise my hands to the Dukdwabich people of this land. Um, uh, some of you might know them as the Duwamish people. Um, they are not currently recognized um, by the United States government. And um, that has to do with the fact that there's so many people living in Seattle and a really a rough colonial history of this specific land. And so uh, when we have a new federal administration, it's our responsibility um, to support them in uh, gaining, um, gaining yeah, treaty rights and uh, yeah, respect from this country. So, uh, I'm just gonna give a quick shout out to my friend Femi that's here. Uh, Femi, can you wave at everybody? So, uh, when I was Femi's age, I, uh, I was really in love with the place that I lived. Um, I lived on the Suquamish, in Suquamish territory, which was across um, the water. And when I was Femi's age, I was obsessed. Can you hear me okay? I was obsessed with swimming in cold water, um, and warm water, and um, any water. And really, when I say obsessed, I mean obsessed. Like, I would beg my mom in the mornings, or at night, or any time that I thought that maybe it wasn't okay for me to go for a swim, and I would convince her to let me go for a swim. And I wouldn't walk or wait for her, I would sprint down to the water, and I would feel the barnacles cut into my feet. And that was like one of my favorite feelings was knowing that I wanted that water so badly that I would do anything to, to be all the way under. And I felt so safe and so healed in that cold salt water. And I felt like I understood everything down there. And basically I tell you that because I want you to know why I care about the Salish Sea. Um, and when I was about 12 years old, I was watching the Oprah show of all, um, of all things, and I learned about the Pacific garbage gyre. And my heart broke. And I had my first big opening. 
And a few weeks later, I went to go sit with a, a man, a good friend of my mom's. Um, Actually, I had good friends of my, of my mom's friend. She wasn't that close with him, but I, I grew really close with him because he really liked me and he liked to hear my, hear my thoughts. And he was a, an elder of the Chippewa Nation. And I asked him, um, I told him a little bit about what I was going through, and he told me that he just got back. And it, he told me a story that I, I can't share because it's not my story, but I'll tell you this. He told me that his people have a way of accessing prayers through pain. And he told me, when he saw my eyes get bright, that maybe there was a way that I could pray my way out of my pain. That only good and true prayers would come true. And after that, I went home and I cried for the earth for the first time. And I cried and I cried and I cried and I cried for the waters. Because I could not understand how someone, given a wish that they believed would come true, could cry for anything but the healing of our ecological systems that healed me all those times when I was a young person. And in that time of crying, I made a promise. I, I later found out that tears are some of the strongest forms of prayer. And in those tears, I made a promise that I would do anything anything in my power to protect the, the waters that I loved. And that I would dedicate my entire life um, to that cause. And when I was 16, I was pursuing straight A's in a position of colonial power, because that's how I was taught um, in K through 12 elementary. And yeah, these, that's how I taught you made a difference, right? You, go, you get straight A's and then you become a lawyer or something and then you, then you can make a difference. And I woke up one morning and I, I was like, the ocean's not getting any better. This can't be right. And I decided that that would be the day that I did whatever I could in my power. And, and in that moment, something shifted. And, and I stopped caring about school. And every single hour, I, I started thinking about what I could do. And I started volunteering for salmon restoration. And I started doing all kinds of work. I got gathered in like three days. I gathered like 500 petitions at my high school to ban plastic bags and convinced a Tea Party Republican. Um, and like the most impossible things as like a 16-year-old. Like I was going into rooms and changing everyone's mind and then getting them to vote on. Like I was like, what? It works? And, and I think the reason I'm telling this story is because I think we all have more power than we know. And I think that when I hear Reuben George talk about the miracles and the miracle work that they're doing, that, that's the work that we all need to be doing. And I think that, uh, so I, I supported a lot of different causes. And, and I just wanted to share that with you because I, that's what came to me to share tonight. And I usually don't rehearse. I usually just speak from my heart. But I really wanted to share that specific story. Um, this is, uh, I helped, I spent like three months of my life not caring about college and focusing on stopping, helping the Lummi Nation um, stop the nation's largest um, proposed coal terminal, and they've won that battle through treaty rights, and that's a local victory story. Um, so the first time I heard about tar sands, um, someone uh, who happens to be in this room tonight uh, came to my hometown and talked a little bit about what David talked about in his, in his uh, testimony tonight. And, I ended up at 17 uh, flying down to Alabama Cushata Territory in Houston, Texas, um, in a small town called Livingston, Texas, to help um, join the Tar Sands blockade to fight the, uh, the southern leg of the Keystone XL pipeline. And when I was there, I met a man named Dakota. And um, <laughs> Um, I learned a lot at the front, action, uh, front Lines Action Camp. I went to a direct action training. Um, I participated in all the meals, and there was like, yeah, hundreds of people from all over with my same exact mentality as a 17-year-old, and I was stoked, and it was like the most exciting few days of my life <laughs> um, at the time. It was like the most fun I've ever had because there's all of a sudden like people that are as radical as me, and I'm like, what? You all, you all care about this thing? This is so cool. And um, I met a man named Dakota, and he um, he was from um, the Kalamazoo River, and um, uh, he loved a place like I love a place, and um, 
The Kalamazoo River is the place that his ancestors walked and the place that he grew up fishing in and playing in um, was desecrated by an unbridged pipeline that burst in his river. And he was on the front lines without an adequate sleeping bag, without adequate clothing, with unwashed clothes, without adequate funding. And he was basically freezing at night. And he had been there without any money for like, I don't know, months and months. And, and basically like, he was the wokest person I'd ever met. And like he, he would do anything to stop that from happening anywhere else. And the way that I felt what happened to his place through him was so powerful to me. So this is the um, Kalamazoo River. And uh, like I said, it's um, completely desecrated. And when tar sand sinks to the bottom of a river or anywhere, it stays there and it releases oil. So it's like a chronic, massive oil spill. So it's not like you spill it once. It's like it sinks. And tar sands can't be cleaned up for 12 hours um, legally. So basically, yeah. So, so basically, like it, like ninety nine percent of it sinks to the bottom before anyone can legally access it because of how volatile its gases are. So when they say there's a forty percent cleanup rate, there's a less than one percent cleanup rate in the Salish Sea, and that's real talk. So. Like, why I decided, like, when I was thinking about what I was going to say up here, I hadn't, I hadn't remembered Dakota in, like, four years. But his, his story came to me instantly, and I realized that's why I care. Because we cannot let that happen here. And these are the three ways that I see potentially stopping this pipeline. Um, when I was helping the Lummi Nation and standing behind them to stop the Gateway Pacific Terminal, I learned a kind of organizing that we call all of the above organizing. And it's, um, it's non-dogmatic strategic organizing that basically looks at what are all of the options and we're not afraid of any of them. And it's kind of like Chief Ruben George said, it's, um, it's, it's no place is a scary place when it comes to protecting the places you love, right? So we're willing to do anything, right? And so. It might mean talking to people, and you might have to hold your nose, but best if you don't, and you actually hear and fully listen to them, you know? Best that we give it our all. So um, the number one way is get enough investors to give up on the process. Um, that can look like a lot of things. It can look like getting the um, BC government to run an environmental impact statement. That can take years of time. It looks like direct action to increase Frontline's momentum. Um, it looks like continued denial of local permits from the BC's New Democratic Party, which just got into office. Um, and it looks like court action with or without a win, um, though there are a lot of lawsuits, even without a win, it costs Kinder Morgan $5.6 million for every month that the project is delayed. Um, so, uh, yeah, the other, other ways to get investors to give up on the process is orchestrating intentional divestment like um, Cedar and Ruben George have been working on, right? So putting pressure on investors through things like mass bank withdrawals and the threat of mass transition to public banks, and also working on with and educating investors um, more from the inside, um, and increasing divestment from Kinder Morgan. And then the third is um, disrupting the profitability of the pro profitability of the project by disrupting the project's long-term plans. So a lot of people don't know this, but if, if the project is stalled in British Columbia, its plan, the company's plan, is to come through Washington State, um, through Whatcom County. And currently, Cherry Point is um, gearing up for enough um, refinery capacity to, to refine all of the tar sands from exact amount of the tar sands coming from the Kinder Morgan pipeline. So they're gearing up right now. So if this, if this process gets stopped up there, we have to do everything in our power to stop it down here. And actually doing that, doing that, um, doing that work ahead of time can, can be a really big deal because um, BC often looks to Washington State for policy decisions. So it's really important that we get our governor and the head of the Department of Ecology to come out against this project. And the last thing is cutting off options for the pipeline to be refined in Washington State through increased stringency of fuel standards and also working with California to do the same thing at the Chevron plant. Um, where, so basically, this tar sands is either going to go overseas, but a lot of it is planned to be refined in Tacoma, Cherry Point, and um, Chevron down in uh, California. And that Chevron plant had 15,000 people um, get injured from, refining, from cor corrosion 
from refining tar sands. So they have a big stake in also um, basically saying that they won't refine tar sands from the Kinder Morgan pipeline in that facility. And then, uh, can y'all hear me still? Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> so yeah, I just did the latest research, but I just heard from Ruben George that this might not be the right number, but there are currently 18 distinct legal proceedings against the Kinder Morgan and Trans Mountain Pipeline, and if one of these, just one of them, wins in court, the project will be stopped. So things that you can do, host a fundraiser and share that fun, uh, or share the fundraising link online for the Pull Together, which is on people's t-shirts if you need to, a little reminder note. And, um, impacting the social and political environment in which the decision is being made. And like I said, it's known that BC looks to Washington State um, for its policy decisions. And it's also known that um, BC is really into this thing like they call social license, which I don't think we really have here. But um, they actually care what like people like Governor Inslee think. Um, I know that that's hard to believe, but <laughs> apparently it's a thing. Um, and then local government statements about free prior informed consent and this also sets us up for a washington state flight fight when it comes or if it comes um, but we just have to prepare for it like it's coming here and then increased awareness about tribal rights um, and then yeah the last thing is provincial legislation in bc can also stop the project so getting the governor of washington state to come out against it again getting the department uh, the director uh, basically the Department of Ecology's executive director to come out against it and then also supporting um, BC lobbying efforts. So I just want to go back really quick and say that environmental impact statements rarely kill projects, but like I said, they can kill projects because oftentimes it extends the timeline of the project too much for profitability and investors will drop out. So anyways, that was a lot of information. <laughs> So for some questions and answers, um, we'd just ask that if you have a question, you come on up to the microphone here. Uh, we'll ask it here and then pass it off to our panelists. Uh, and I know that I have roughly an hour's worth of questions, so I would just ask that you keep it concise uh, and to the point if you do have anything to ask. Everybody at once now. Yep. Yeah, do you want to just pop up here real quick? And anybody else that cares to, to come up and, and form a, a short line over to the side here, you are certainly welcome to do so. My question is for Chief Rubin. Um, I'm really inspired and thankful for all the work that you've done. Um, I was really taken aback, though, went in your praise for Elon Musk. And I wonder if you believe that um, Elon Musk and, um, say, Richard Kinder are part of the same um, colonial system, and if you do, um, what that means for activism going forward, or if you don't have that critique, um, why, I guess. Thank you. I don't know him personally, but... Um, well, when, when he came up with the plans for the for the, the Tesla, he, he could have hoarded all his plans, um, the technology, the patents, but he released them all, and 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 so the other companies could catch on um, from the interviews and things that I've seen from him. He, he wants to change the world in a positive way, and and um, I don't I don't know if I believe him when he says I don't care about money, but what I do care about is is changing things. Um, I like his green energy stuff. Um, would I want to be a pa passenger on on the, on the trip to Mars? Probably not. <laughs> but his green energy stuff I admire. His his um, his uh, mutual admiration for um, Nikola Tesla, you know, I, I like and and uh, is a cool dork. Yeah. 
<laughs> my, my son's walking by. I, you, you asked if your figures are right on 18 court cases. That's right, there's 12 provincial. Um, there, there's two Washington state tribes, soon the um, American Coast Guard, and the rest are, um, actually the 12 are, sorry, are federal, and two Washington state tribes suing the American Coast Guard, and, and, the, and the rest are suing the province, and those are tribes. But um, Cedar's just walking by, and I, I forgot to mention, and um, um, I love the, the, and the young girl, I saw you, I see you everywhere, I think I saw you standing rock. And um, <laughs> amazing presentation, and, and um, but at Cedar's work in Canada, we met with uh, all university students from about seven universities in the Vancouver area, and uh, they're, they're gonna do a concert, and they wanna bring in Knuckle Bear and um, a tribe called Red, but they're gonna promote that to bring in a big rally. Um, everywhere I've been around the world, whether it was 500,000 kids in, in Brazil or, or um, 700,000 or whatever it was in Paris and, and f almost a million in Mexico, is all youth driven. So um, we just had a meeting today uh, with Nathan, young university student, and some others um, wanted to do the same thing here at the universities here and do big heavy push. So hopefully they'll ask some of the fine panelists here to also present in in some of the universities that they want to do push. But uh, I just wanted to give a shout out for Cedar for helping to organize that in British Columbia, and also here in Washington State. His mom's uh, Deborah Parker from Tulela, and, and um, so his, his duo, and, and Kaya's been working right along with them. So the university students here, and, and, and the young girl too, um, it'd be good to uh, connect with Cedar. So what I wanted to ask um, was what could I do um, to, you know, like warn, like to tell my school or like, you know, tell them about climate change and stuff and all the pipelines because they're not aware of that and I would like them to know about that so they can, you know, study more about that and they can get involved and stuff. Awesome. Oh, that's like my daughter. She was that age when we started. Cedar was, um, how old are you? Um, nine. <gasps> that's how old Kaya was. My daughter, now she's uh, third year university in um, our college. And, and Cedar was, he was that short at one time. Look at that. <laughs> but um, coming here is so important. And I, and I think it's great. And I, you know, Youth, I really believe in the youth. Um, when, when, when Cedar went to Paris, he got in his last year 10 times more media than I did. When, when Kaya went, uh, Twitter, is it Twitter? Snapchat. Snapchat? Um, she got 1.3 million view, views. She trended with Leonardo DiCaprio and President Obama in Paris. And, and they do that. And I think of the same with you. I would listen to you. I would, I would listen to you. You know, it would be really neat, um, the, the, guy, the gentleman here has a camera. If, if you do your Twitter and um, Snapchats and Facebook posts and, and, and tell, interview your friends, talk to them. And I think people would really listen if you said, you know, we're concerned. I think everyone here would listen. You know, they're probably tired to see me on Facebook. We'd probably love to see a beautiful young girl. <laughs> But things like that, and then maybe even go organize a meeting and talk to your principal and say, hey, we, we want divestment. Make sure that you're not doing anything with oil and get rid of all the plastic bags in the school here. Because, uh, I don't know, um, you, you got a hot lunch program at school? So you already got a good start. But another thing too is, um, I don't know if they still have it, but there's, there's um, federal grants available to, to have, not only with your hot lunches, but to grow your own lunches. To, there's, a, there's a garden program that we were part of. Remember that, son? 
uh, the garden program that um, when I was in, working in elementary schools, I bet you they still have similar programs. Any more questions? I think it's really important to be in the classrooms. They're the ones that are going to inherit this mess that we've made. Um, I got to speak to a couple of eighth grade classes and they all supposedly read my book. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> but you know it, that that's where the the word needs to get out because uh, old codgers like me aren't going to be around forever, and I'm not going to witness the worst of this. They're the ones that are going to inherit it. It sounds awful, wisdom, but it's it's true, and uh, they are the future. I'm just really glad that you asked the question. <laughs> Can I speak real loud? Maybe I, because I, I was too embarrassed to go around. Sure. And my questions are embarrassing. Um, really, honestly, when Trudeau spoke, I, I remembered what you said. He said, hey, I'm cool with this. And he turned around, and I don't know what happened. What did somebody tell him that he was going to get that he changed his mind? I was really hopeful. And then the other thing I was hopeful for is that, okay, there's only so many tar sands and there's so many kinds of things that Kinder Martin could do. So I heard something on the uh, TV or somewhere on the radio and it said, the price of energy has gone down so much that Canada has decided, I'm not kidding you, that it's not worth for Kinder Morgan is going to lose all this money and so everything's going to be okay. So I went to my group and I said, I heard this today. I, it's not fake news, but somehow it's not accurate news. <laughs> uh, because, and then I asked somebody and they said, hey, that's because if Kinder Morgan loses everything on this deal, all the way around, every single thing that could go wrong, and we win in every single way, they still make lots of money. And I said, hey, I want to figure that one out <laughs> for myself. Um, so my question is, if all of this is, it doesn't matter what happens, they're going to do okay. How could there be so many things going on and they still win at the end, no matter what we do. What we would have is everything will be wonderful, but then the next company is going to come around and say, well, all we have to do is do the same thing that Kinder Morgan did. That's a, a big question because it, it doesn't seem like it's just going to be circular. So, and then why did Trudeau change his mind? I think similar as Obama, when he got in with Trudeau, I think, I think he did have some legitimate good ideas to, to do some good work. But I think once he got in, he found out pretty quick he doesn't run anything. It's the same companies that have been running things for a long time still do. And, um, you know, he, and, 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 and it, to me, though, he just made a political choice to support his friends and he'd do whatever it takes to get in there. They're methodical. Kinder Morgan, they're, they're methodical. All of them are. They, what they say, what they do, and how they do it, they copy us. I got my mom to come out, just, you know, little grandma, and she said, warrior up. Let's stop it. And they, they hired an executive to be head of their PR campaign, and it was a little grandma saying, this is clean and this is good. And um, with, with the tar sands, though, it, they're, they're really secretive on, on, on their technology. For example, our studies show that you, know, you can only clean up 20%, but we're not even sure how to clean it up. To put that mass oil through the pipeline, they have to make it slipperier. But they patent that technology to make it slipperier so since they patented it, we, we can't go and find out what is on there. It'd be infringement on their patent. And um, I think that's part of a lot of what they're doing. Their technology keeps growing that they're able to maintain. And, and I remember when I started, they said if it goes, 
it goes like 70 cents, they can't do it. Got to 70 cents a barrel. If it goes to 60 cents, got to 60. Well, when it goes under 50 percent or 50 dollars, sorry, a barrel, uh, you know, uh, they kept on going, and and their technology is moving with those times. And um, the, can you imagine um, a quarter trillion dollars coming out of the tar sands a year? That they would have the best possible scientists and t people, engineers working to to make those things happen. When I went there, I was freakily impressed with what they have. You know, you go to Houston, Texas, and you look in Seattle, if you do Google Earth, you look at maybe 100 emission plants. And, you know, but Houston, Texas, where they live, Richard Kinder lives, and all those guys live, Bushes live, everybody lives on there that's connected to the well. They have 21,000 emission plants, they have 50, 51 miles of emission plants. And they're, they don't care, you know, they're breathing it in. If you go to Houston, Texas, and the wind blows a certain direction, you could smell it. They don't, that's where they live. And they, they you know, they're, but if you think, if they, if, they, if they think they live like that, think of what you, what they would do to protect it. And, um, but, you know, they do come around and they do say things, but we'll be there again. You know, I'm getting tired, like, I can't do 12 hour days anymore for years. And that's what I did and, and I paid a price for it. But my son can. <laughs> I think your question was, you asked why is it still going forward and so forth. Yeah, or, economics. The economics, okay, let's talk about that. I don't want it. He let's, got, it let's, doesn't make sense to me. Well, I mentioned in my talk that it, it's real marginal, you know, I mean, if the price of oil went back down to where it was a while back, the, the things I've read anyway, it, it doesn't make sense. Uh, but there's a couple of things I would say that uh, tr as far as Trudeau goes, you know, this all started, the talk of it started back when, the, when we were in that recession. And the price of a lot of the minerals in Canada and, and then oil too, started dropping and a lot of the revenues they use for their social programs in Canada come from taxes on those extraction things. So it put a lot of pressure on him and BC for the most part doesn't want it, that's true, but Alberta has a very different way of thinking and it's politics, you know, he's got to, he, he, he's going to do, you know, I, I don't want to question his motives too much, but it is politics, you know, and uh, but some some Albertans, they, they don't want it. Unifor is the biggest union in, in Canada, and, and they don't want it. But, you know, I, I never bash a nation that signs a deal. I never get mad at somebody who's working there. But Unifor is the biggest union in Canada, and they don't want it. And they implore to Canada. They wrote a letter of support the nation standing up and said, we want green energy jobs. Put the subsidies out of the fossil fuels to green energy. And that was Alberta. Where was I? <laughs> so the tax revenue and uh, yeah, I, I think one of the better tactics that you mentioned is delaying. What's ha what happened to coal? Everybody wanted to ship coal all over the place and then the price of coal started going down and the, and the alternative energy stuff started getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and now they aren't so excited about shipping coal by rail and so forth here and there, and that's part of the reason you're able to defeat it up there at uh, the Lummi Reservation, I think. Whoops. How many people in this audience are old enough to remember whoops? They kind of got delayed and delayed and delayed, and then finally the investors gave up. So, you know, you were on the right track with a lot of the stuff you had to say about investors and delay and, you know, there's some amazing stuff that's happening with alternative energy. You guys probably know better than I do, but you know, the uh, solar's getting cheaper, the wind's getting cheaper, there's new technologies coming around. Uh, everybody in the world's doing it pretty much, but us, we're kind of starting to lag behind. But. I think we've got time for two more, so. So all of us here
clearly know that climate change is a huge issue and we need to do something about it and the pipelines are a huge issue. How do we talk to people, not who necessarily don't, but who are just overwhelmed and have kind of given up? They're like, well, this can't be my problem because this, I can't. Um, how, would we, how do we reach them? And any of you, especially those of you who deal with communication, this might be a good question for. Well, I thought they were all going to read my book and just rise up against it, but it isn't quite that simple. There is definitely no one-size-fits-all answer to this question. Um, one of the things that I, I do is work with the labor community on climate change, which I, I find a really refreshing and interesting space, because the values of the labor community are about good jobs and protecting workers' health. And they've had a lot of division in the labor movement in the United States over pipelines and the Keystone XL pipeline. So it's a community that is not of one mind about climate change. And, um, you know, I, there is a, a willingness to engage and an interest in understanding the issues, but I think you know, as someone who feels very passionately about climate change, we definitely have to approach conversations with people who aren't of our mind with a very open attitude and respect for their perspectives. Because a lot of communities in, in the United States that either don't think about or deny climate change are facing a whole lot of hurt. They might be facing an opioid epidemic or high levels of unemployment and are facing really tough problems about employment. And so we have to have a lot of compassion for the reasons that people are of mixed minds and misinformed about climate change, even as we sort of filter our anger towards the people who are using their wealth and power to commit climate crimes. So I don't have a good answer, but I think that just approaching the work with an open mind and, and humility when you're having these conversations is really, really important. I, I was in politics for a very short period of time and, and, you know, politics is messy, but if people aren't willing to get engaged in, in electing people, well, you already saw what could happen very recently, I mean, can you imagine? Uh, there is some big money in the United States that has spent one hell of a lot of money, not just the Koch brothers, but a lot of others too. And they keep putting those messages out and out and out, you know, clean coal. How many times have you heard clean coal? Yeah. Well, there's nothing very clean about coal. Uh, but, and, and similar messages. And eventually, you know, like they said about Hitler or Hitler said it or something, that if you tell a lie often enough, it becomes a truth. Well, there, there's a certain amount of truth. That's why, you know, Trump gets up there. I hope I'm not setting up. Well, I hope I am stepping on somebody's toes. But... Uh, he keeps saying that same stuff over and over and over again, and eventually, obviously, some people bought it, you know? I mean, enough people bought it. Not a majority, but the deck is stacked against us a little bit, too, and that's because, you know, at the, you know, a few years back, the, the Koch brothers and, and the like, they started organizing really well. They said, how are we gonna do this? Let's put people on the school board, and then we'll get them elected to, you know, the county commissioner, and then we'll move them on up to the state legislature. We'll give them a hell of a lot of money to, to get elected, you know, because money it helps to put up the signs and do the ads and everything. And, and, and then they gerrymandered the hell out of these states, which almost makes it impossible to elect a Democrat. And that's what we're stuck with right now. I mean, in Virginia, you know, there's a bunch of legislators, Democratic legislators got a bunch of votes, but because of because of the tricks, not just gerrymandering, but figuring how to select out people because they call it voter fraud, take their ballots and throw them away. Uh, this is really serious. This is a real attack on our democracy, and, and we've got to fight it. Actually, um, to answer your question, um, we, um, we came from as many angles and, and diverse people as possible. Like the young girl that spoke, <laughs> When my kids were young, I was, I was like, you know what, start watching 
you, they're also on YouTube. So I said, watch Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Kennedy, watch these speeches. And they found this one, like, it was nine years ago on, I think Cedar did, on Charlie Chaplin, amazing speech. And they kept on doing this and looking it up and finding it. And, and it was perfect, a young, articulate, hip kid going to speak in to get 1.3 twit uh, views on their Twitter. But also, no, nobody's gonna listen to Big Native Man, First Nation. So, so um, my, my lawyer is uh, Chinese, and he, he does great. And then, and then um, our, um, our PR person is a white dude, and I said, come on, speak, and they're all speaking. I got my mom to speak, I, my son, and they're all doing a great job, but we have to be diverse. It's, this is a really diverse crowd, and, and we need that diversity to do it, and, and, uh, and that's what I've been like, trying to push with the university students. There's all different walks of life. I saw them, met with them. There's all different types, but they all care, and we needed them to impact their, what they're into, and, and for youth, we think it's music. Um, they, they know better than me, and I, I just made a suggestion. They loved it, and so let's. So we, we, we try to be diverse as possible. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Let me just say one more. At the risk of sounding too political, there is some good news. Have you seen what's been going on recently? There's getting to be a, quite a few progressive folks that are actually running for office and getting real involved just, just in the last, well, since the last election. I mean, that was a wake-up call. Maybe that'll do more good than harm in the long run, you know. Uh, I would, could only hope. Thanks, everybody. So it seems like a lot of pressure to ask the last question. But um, I want to thank the organizers for putting on this really great evening. I know a lot of work went into it. Um, I'm really interested as a white person what motivates or what can genuinely motivate white people doing this work, which is uh, rightly, righteously, more and more indigenous led, maybe always, always has been. So like as a white person, what, what motivates you? I mean, I mean, we can talk about elections and um, and scientific fact, which are both really important. But like when I heard you speaking, it's Dave, right? Um, seemed like your love of the water that you got to know as a child um, was maybe one of the most important things to you. And when you played, is it Judy? When you played that um, recording uh, of the data with the, the sound of the whales and the ships kind of colliding, um, it seemed like something out of a place of love. Me, myself, I'm trying to understand my own cultural roots, Scottish, Irish, English, and what my ancestors went through in the land that we were once close to and bound to. And I'm, I, I, I'm trying to understand how that motivates me. So I just wanted to like ask that question, especially to the white people on the panel. And I don't know um, if all the three of you are white or not, but um, like what motivates you culturally or in your hearts uh, to do the great work that you're doing? <laughs> well, I already mentioned it, you know, going forward, it, everybody knows in this room, um, it's gonna be really tough. It's going to be really tough. My, my children and grandchildren, and I've even got one great-grandchild now, uh, they're going to have some really unbelievable challenges. I mean, I've, I've heard a lot of talks from 350.org and so forth, and, and uh, some, a lot of the scientists are just saying, oh my god, you know, I mean, if this thing goes to four or six degrees, it's all over for all practical purposes. So we, if we don't, have a miracle coming forth real soon here, uh, and keep it down to two or so. We're we're in just huge trouble. People are going to suffer. They're going to die. They're going to all the the oceans are going to rise. All those folks in Bangladesh and down in that part are going to where are they going to run to? We, we've seen what happened in Myanmar. They're 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 turning them back. The boats are coming. They're turning them back. They don't want them. They don't have room for them. Those are poor countries already. Uh, what's going to happen in sub-Saharan Africa? What's going to happen? Mexico, what if Mexico goes up 
a few more degrees. It's pretty hot down there already, and in the southwest, where's the water going to come from? It, I could go on and on and on. It's just, it, it's, it's bleak if we don't get our stuff together. Um, I don't know exactly how to answer your question, partly because I'm grappling with that myself and my racial identity. I'm a fifth generation Washingtonian, so my great, great, great grandparents were settlers on the Olympic Peninsula, and for three generations my family was in the logging community, um, chopping down trees and making a living at it. Um, and that's not something I'm proud of. And I grew up um, spending the best parts of my summers also swimming in the Puget Sound and finding solace there and really identifying with children's books about um, Native peoples. And, um, you know, I, I'm really honored to be on this panel <laughs> with Chief Reuben George and seeing the, the leadership from the First Nations. And so maybe one thing is that um, white people need to give up the spotlight and listen a lot better and, uh, and learn from the wisdom of, of other cultures. answers to this question, but I'll try and keep it serious. Um, <laughs> uh, I guess my answer to the question is, uh, if we're really thinking in the eyes of the ocean or like the eyes of the movement, you know, and we're really having that more bird's eye perspective, then I guess we know, I know, I feel in that space that it's like very rare that it's my time to speak, you know? And um, and sometimes it is, and I, I had a really hard time preparing for this presentation because I thought about all the people who I'd rather hear from than myself. And, uh, and uh, then I think about people like Femi, and I think about my little kid self that loves the ocean so much. And uh, I know that uh, she has things to say. And, uh, that you know, she's got she's got a lot to say about um, what's happening in the world, and that she can touch people's hearts that maybe um, can't be touched in any other way, you know, or moved in any other way. And I think uh, I just try and give that that little self a voice. So that's how I cope, I guess. And yeah, yeah. I think it's a really important time, and it's an important time as a white person. Um, my ancestors are from the Mediterranean Sea, uh, skilled sailors and uh, fisher people and um, German farmers, uh, grasslands in Germany. So that's where I come from and I grew up in the Salish Sea. So I guess as a white person, um, not really doing it now, I guess, but yeah, stepping back and um, at the same time owning your power, you know, and listening to the part of you that needs to say something and what, you know, knowing the difference. questions and the insightful answers. Uh, so we don't want you to leave uh, without understanding that we can and we will stop this pipeline. Uh, so real quick, I mentioned our, our co-sponsors earlier uh, in the evening and we're just going to have a representative from each of those organizations come up to the front real quick and give a, a 30 second blurb on what they're doing, um, how you can get involved. Uh, in ways that we can go forward to uh, make sure this pipeline never gets anywhere near being constructed. So come on up. Hey everyone, my name is Angela Cruz and I'm with Students for the Salish Sea at the University of Washington. Um, thank you for coming. There's a lot of momentum that got built here today and I know that we want to really ride that curtail. Skirtail? But uh, we do have a sign-up sheet if you'd like to get information from us. We're going to be meeting soon just to talk and decide on what we want to do. And if you're an organizer, please come up to myself or Claire after, raise your hand, and talk to us and we'll exchange information. I'm looking at you uh, for the concert. <laughs> and yeah, so thank you so much. Sign up, talk to us, thanks.
everybody. My name is Curtis. Um, I'm a part of a group, <laughs> <What's> up, <Cedar? laughs> part of a group called the Mosquito Fleet. Um, the Mosquito Fleet is, uh, we call ourselves a regional network of climate activists. Our focus is uh, taking action on the water, mostly to prevent the expansion of the fossil fuel industry here in the Sailor Sea. Um, what that looks like in practice is often getting out there in kayaks or anything that floats to get in the way of things. Um, but it looks like a lot of different things too. Um, this summer we put on, with a lot of other groups, uh, an event called the Oil Free Salish Sea Action Camp, which brought together people on both, from both sides of the border to really train together and, and uh, learn from each other about how we can really unite across this border to stop this pipeline. So if anybody's interested in hearing more about the Mosquito Fleet or the fight against Kinder Morgan, I'm always down to talk more with people. Um, so feel free to hit me up anytime, come say hi at the end of this event, or check us out on Facebook. Um, but we're just really proud and honored to be a part of this event tonight, to hear from Ruben and everybody else. So thanks, y'all. Hi, y'all. I'm Nathan. I'm with the Sierra Club, but also uh, with Raven Trust, who's helping with the fundraising efforts for the First Nations up in uh, Canada and BC. Um, so I really appreciate all the panelists. I uh, appreciate the co-sponsors and the organizers of the event. Um, so we're talking about like what can we do with all this knowledge that we've been sharing here. And one of the ways in which we can do that is by fundraising. That's the chief way we can stand in solidarity with, first, with the four First Nations. And um, one of the ways you can do that is by um, going over to this apparel over here, which all the proceeds go to the campaign. Um, or donating online, of which I can show you the link if you come over. Um, we'd love to have Cedar and I and people with the um, students of the Salish City would love to have people come up to us and approach us about doing divestment actions on their campuses. Uh, I would, as a student, I would love to see more people get involved and more young people get involved in taking ownership of our future. Um, so please approach us. <laughs> um, and yeah, love to see you come over and talk to us about hosting a fundraiser possibly, so look out for on this coming Monday, the 20th, at East 1919 Prospect Street. We're gonna be talking about how you can we can do more fundraisers and uh, continue to reach our goal, which we're only $18,000 away from. So, thank you so much. Hi, I'm Ruchi. I'm with 350 Seattle. And I would like to invite you to join together with us to fight this pipeline. Uh, you all have a flyer that was on your seat, and we'd like to invite you to join us um, at a meeting this coming Monday where we're planning our next steps on how to stop this pipeline. Uh, all along the West Coast, uh, with fossil fuel um, uh, project after fossil fuel project, each time we fight, we win. So come together, together we're strong. When we fight, we, we win. win. Thank you everyone so much for coming out. Can we hear it one more time for our incredible panelists? We hear it for ourselves for showing up and caring. I really hope to see everyone at that Monday meeting. Uh, we've got a lot of momentum, we've got a lot of education happening, and we would love to see you out in the streets, in the forest, and on the seas. Thank you so much.